and uh, welcome if you're joining us on YouTube. Uh, we're in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25, and I'm going to be uh, speaking with uh, Fiona, um, so we're going to be sort of sharing it together. So let me just read Genesis 2, I'm going to read from 18 to 25. Everyone there? Yeah? Amazing? Cool. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam no suitable helper was found. So God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now, obviously we're going to be talking about marriage. And this passage is quite challenging uh, for many people in today's culture, as we will see. So, um, just sort of hang on to your seats, okay? Um, fasten your seatbelts. Don't walk out. Um, see where we go. I'm going to plunge straight in and um, keep going because we've got a, a certain amount to get to. Right, the first point is human beings were made for fellowship, not for power. Didn't quite get the um, power part right, but never mind. Human beings were made for fellowship and not for power. That was the point of the family time, of the tug of war. Most people uh, engage in like a, a tug of war, you know, trying to. Go after power. Power is the thing. But we will make the fellowship. Now, verse 18, it says that something was not good in the Garden of Eden. And the thing that was not good is that for man to be alone. And God says, I'll make a helper suitable for him. Why was it not good? I mean, he's got God. He's got animals. What more do you want? And he's, he's got lovely trees, he's got, it's all beautiful. What more does he want? Well, Adam was made in the image of God, right? Yes. Okay, he was made in the image of God. And what is God like? You say the word God, what do you think of? God is, God is love. Thank you. Okay, very quick over there. God is love. To be made in the image of God People have to love. And you cannot love, I know, yes, we can love animals and we can love places and so on, but love in a backwards and forwards way is only really fulfilled properly between two human beings. Okay? So, and, and God makes, um, so that we make God image, He is love. And uh, God brings the animals to man and the naming of the animals is an exercise of power. But the animals are not a suitable helper. Because our do I, we have a dog, our dog loves me. I mean I come down in the morning and she is so excited to see me. Do you know why she's excited? Because I feed her. If I didn't feed her, she wouldn't be excited. Okay? Animals, you know, they're there for what they can get out of it. It's not really the same. Um, and the world gets, but the world gets this so wrong. So the world it thinks the purpose of life is power. You see that in politics, you see it between nations, you see it in, you know, people getting wealth. Why do they want wealth? Because wealth brings power. Uh, in social dynamics, even in marriage, People get it wrong and think, well, it's about me getting them to do what, they'll, uh, what they want. I remember a vicar once uh, had a very nervous bride 
and he said, when you get married, you only have to think, you don't have to think about anything. You just walk down the aisle, stop at the altar, and we sing a hymn. Okay, that's all you've got to remember. Aisle, walk down the aisle, get to the altar, sing a hymn. As she walked up the aisle, she was heard to mutter, aisle, altar, hymn. Aisle, altar, hymn. Aisle, altar, hymn. And people get that wrong. Okay, it's not about that. You, you, I'm responsible for changing me, not for changing uh, Helen. Okay, that's the first thing. Uh, we're making fellowship. The, the second thing is that God makes a suitable helper. The animals are not a suitable helper. Uh, and we see that there is, uh, first of all, equality. Because she's made from, a bone, from, from the same stuff as the man. Okay, a rib from his side. Um, and um, he can say, bone of my bones. There was, a, there was a really cool guy who lived 350, 400 years ago called Matthew Henry, wrote commentaries on the entire Bible, every verse of the Bible he wrote a commentary on. Um, and he said about this verse, he said, the woman is not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. Great, isn't it? So, uh, but she's also different. She's a woman. And how many of you know men and women are different? Okay? Uh, whatever the extreme transgender lobby and people say today, men and women are really different. If you don't believe me, get married. I mean, you will soon discover that men and women are different. My wife looks at me and thinks, how can you say that? I mean, what is so obvious to her? And I, 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 I that's silly, just laughing. I mean, you know, they just think, I, I mean, you know, I, I, how many wives look at their husband and think, how can, how can so much stupidity reside in one person? <laughs> you know? But men, that's just, it, it's not that we're stupid, it's just we're different. Um, um, and, um, you know, to say otherwise flies in the face of biology, experience, and what God says. Um, so we're different. And, and we're made for love. Okay? For relationship. Um, and that's why this is the first love song. I, I think probably what he said um, originally, and it didn't come through in the Hebrew, was, where, you know, God brings, it's interesting, God brings the animals to man, but they're not suitable. And then he brings the woman, rather like a father giving away the bride, walking up the aisle. It's that, that's the image. Um, and what does he say? Wow! That's, that's, that's the literal, you know, the, 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 the sort of um, the paraphrase. Um, and, and I guess, you know, many husbands have stood at the front, knees knocking, and, and, um, and, and then you know, they've looked around when the music starts and the vicar says, everyone stand up, the bride comes in and gone, wow, I remember thinking, for a fraction of a second, we've got the wrong, the wrong girl. She was so stunning. Just for a, you know, a, a, a hundredth of a second, um, I panicked. Wrong girl's coming in. <laughs> the right girl. Um, and then, thirdly, there is the, the foundation of marriage. Um, and it is between a man and a woman. Verse 24, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And the three ingredients, you see, are is it, it's exclusive. He is to leave his father and mother, and she is to leave her father and mother. Okay? Parents are the major sort of people in people's lives, but when they get married, parents, we are no longer the major input, the, na the major person in someone's life. You know, the, the, the spouse comes first. Um, because it is an exclusive relationship. That there is something in that bond that no one else can quite get in. You can't get as close to someone uh, as their spouse. Um, uh, it, it's, it's permanent. They are to be united. Um, which is why in, in marriage you say, till death us do part, for better or worse, sickness and health, etc., till death us do part. And then it is to be one flesh. Um, 
which is two individuals become one in God's sight. Uh, there is a oneness in marriage. Um, and that's symbolised by sexual union. And this is why sex outside marriage is wrong, because you're, having, you're becoming one with someone. Paul says, if you, if you go to a prostitute, you become one with them. Just a one-night stand, you've become one with them. Um, and it, it's like gluing two pieces of paper together. You can glue two pieces of paper together, but, and you can pull them apart, but it's damaged. And if you pull apart, it's da there's damage. But you've become one without uh, the permanence or the exclusiveness. Does that make sense? You've become one, but you haven't said this is going to be a permanent thing or this is exclusive. Because I might sleep with other people. Uh, and again, that goes quite contrary to our culture, doesn't it? Quite contrary. Um, but I want to say that the thing about the one flesh is that it is, it, uh, between a man and a woman, it reflects the nature of God. Again, we're made in the image of God. It reflects the nature of God because God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, distinct, but one. You see, Adam all alone, as we say, couldn't reflect the nature of God because he was alone. But God has loved from all eternity because the Father loved the Son, the Son loved the Spirit, the Spirit loved, etc. There was a, a, a relationship of love before the world was made, which is why God is love. And he said, that's why Allah cannot be loved because before he made the world, there was no one for Allah to love. You can't be loved unless you have someone to love. Does that make sense? You with me? Um, and uh, marriage symbolizes this. Marriage symbolizes that we are made in the image of God. Now, I want to say that um, uh, marriage is, is, is central in just about every human culture. I'm not sure they've ever discovered a human culture where marriage is not honored in some way. I know there are, there are, you know, there are disastrous marriages and so on. But I think, you, you know, when they, go, when they go into the, 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 you know, and find tribes and so forth in the Amazon, they still get married. Um, there may be a tribe somewhere that doesn't, but uh, it, it, it's very central in human culture. And what I want to say to single people is they're caught up in it. Sing, you know, whether you're, you're widowed, not yet married, uh, divorced, separated, whatever, you're caught up into this. So we, we all reflect the image of God because marriage is central in human society. Does that make sense? You see, it's not that married people are more in the image of God than single people. We're all in the image of God. And because marriage is, 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 is part of um, uh, the whole of human culture, which is why marriage gets attacked so much. Um, so, um, uh, and of course, the, 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 the heart of it, uh, and the, for me, for, as a married person, part of the challenge, the central challenge, is uh, verse 25. The man and his wife were naked and there was no shame. Because I guess in every marriage now, since Genesis 3, there's an element of shame. There's an element of, I'm doing something and I'm ashamed of, and um, it's really challenging. Um, and, and I know in my own marriage, you know, I've done things which I've been ashamed of, and, and it creates distance in the, in the relationship. And we have to sort it through and sort it out and, and, um, and so on. Um, so um, that's where... Um, you know, that's why, again, it has to be between a man and a woman. That's marriage. Um, relationships, uh, same-sex marriage is not marriage because it, they're two people the same, two men or two women. is not the same as a man and a woman because they're, they're two the same. Does that make sense? I mean, it doesn't matter what the government says. Okay, Governments can be very, very, very wrong. And in, I believe in that instance, our government was very, very wrong. Uh, that's not to say we don't uh, care for and love people who are same-sex attracted. We should do that. But we cannot say it's okay for two people of the same sex to have sex together or to be married. Okay.
I'm going to stop there. We can, um, I'll, I'll say a bit more to the end, but I'm going to hand over to Fiona at this point. Okay? Hello, everyone. Um, so, Genesis 2, I've read many, many times. I've taught on it and I've enjoyed the picture it paints of the vital role of men and women and the vital role that the man plays and the vital role that the woman plays. And balance is found there, isn't it? On Friday we were on a, a seesaw where we had to balance out the teams and it, was, uh, it took our team a long time to balance it out. And in, the, in Genesis 2 you find the balance of the man and the woman. And I love Genesis 2 as well because it mirrors revelation at the end of the Bible. The idea that the man and the woman are married, just as the woman walks down the aisle to meet the groom, the church, the bride of Christ, will meet um, the groom, Jesus Christ himself, at the end of time. And it's just wonderful. It's like two bookends. I am single because I am currently not married. Anyone who is not married is single, whether that be through divorce or through death, being widowed, or never being married. And I used to teach uh, GCSE RE, RS, and I used to say to the kids, no one in here can commit adultery. And they used to, it's quite a difficult word sometimes, adultery for, for young people to understand, because no one in here is married. And then there's one young person who thinks it's really funny to say, actually I am, and I'm like, okay, you're married, you can commit adultery, but the rest of us can't. Um, and so, as someone who is not married, I am single. And one of the joys of being in Christchurch um, has been the discussions. I've been working for Christchurch for three years, and today is actually my final day. Um, and I have worked for Christchurch for three years, and one of the joys of it has been the discussions I've had with Caroline, with Hugh, with Anna, about how church went on Sunday and, and what is coming up in the future. And it's as a result of one of those conversations that he then invited me to share my thoughts on singleness. So really this isn't exploring the Bible so much as reflections on what the Bible says and what Genesis 2 says. And if the Bible is God's word, which I believe it is, then Genesis 2 has something for all of us to understand. And it'd be easy to switch off and say, oh, I don't, I don't really need to listen to this bit about marriage because I'm not married. Well, actually, it's important for us to hear every single part of the Bible. And so I would say my first point out of four, my first point of reflection is this. To choose to celebrate and support marriage, whether you're married or not. Because it's what God has designed. When I first moved to South East London, I lived in a house with two friends, two people who became precious friends. And in the time that I lived there, uh, in our second year of living together, uh, both of them got married. One in the March, one in the August of our second year. My life changed considerably because they, got mar they moved out and got married. My life had to change. Theirs changed and got married and they had wonderful weddings and they moved into homes with their, uh, with their husbands. And I was, it felt like I'd been left. And that was really tough. That was really tough as a result of marriage. I've sat in wedding ceremonies in this very building, in this very room. Guests have arrived looking beautiful. The church is buzzing, everybody's in their finery. There's a settled hush and then the bride walks in. Everyone turns round and he used the word wow earlier. People say, wow, the bride looks amazing. The groom is at the front often with his best man and the whole thing is amazing. I long for that. I long for people to say, wow, it's hard. People leave and move on. You go to ceremonies and you want to be part of it, centrally part of it. And friends who don't yet know Jesus and who live together and then choose to get married, you think, ah, they're getting married. And in that situation, as a single person, I choose to celebrate them getting married. I choose to say wow to the bride. I choose to turn up in my finery to the wedding. I choose to congratulate my friends who move out and leave me with two different people to live with because it's good to celebrate and support marriage.
we can recognise and celebrate marriage and live in the moment where we can wonderfully say to people, you're doing a fantastic thing. And indeed, there are times where my married friends have said, things are really tough this week, this month, this year. Our marriage is boring. We are arguing. We're not connecting. Um, we're both so tired because we've got young children that it feels like all we do is get up, do the day, go to bed. There is nothing, there is no joy in this situation, in this marriage. And what can we as single people do? We can choose to sit down and pray with the people. We can sit down and pray and love them and encourage them. There's part of me that thinks, well, you've chosen marriage, so you've, got a, you've made your bed lie in it. But actually, if the Bible says marriage is good, I choose to celebrate marriage with them and help them and pray for them. Romans 12 verse 13, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So in every circumstance in life, we rejoice in the marriage ceremony, we rejoice in all the excitement, we look through all the hundreds and hundreds of photos at the end of the, end of the wedding, we then sit with our families and our friends who get married and we celebrate with them and we support them through the times, the good times and the bad times, the weeping and the rejoicing. We choose to celebrate and support marriage as God's design. And secondly, a wedding and marriage isn't life's highest calling. Can I get an amen? Amen. In God's eyes, it is not our highest calling. So help me out here. A classic fairy tale beginning starts with once upon a time. And then the end with happily ever after. Okay. I am 40 and I was born in 1981 and I lived through all those films. I watched the films in the 1980s, probably before that, 1990s, where people um, have the difficult lives and they meet the man and they get married and then it ends with happily ever after. That was the diet of films, music, TV, everything that, uh, that I grew up in because that's what culture put in front of me. Um, even Disney, right? Even the Disney princess meets Prince Charming and it's all good. And we could even believe that in church, couldn't we? Um, that marriage is the highest calling. It's like the best thing that could happen to any of us. And it proves that we are perfect and it proves that we've been chosen. And Hugh has said, quite rightly, marriage is central to our Christian lives, whether we're married or not, whether we're single or married. But... It is not the highest calling. It's not the highest calling because the greatest commandment, Jesus said, is to love God and to love our neighbour. He doesn't say, and by the way, you've also got to get married. Because Jesus, newsflash, did not get married. Neither did St Paul. Neither of these key central people, the son of God himself, didn't get married. Neither did Paul. And, and part of my degree was... Uh, I studied anthropology, which is the study of people and cultures at university. And um, as you said, the vast majority of societies across the world actually have a marriage ceremony of some sort. And sometimes that marriage ceremony involves more than one wife, um, and sometimes it's just one man, one woman. It's a rite of passage. And it's also a status changer. It's also a status changer. The ring in this, in this society might go on the finger in engagement and then a second ring on the woman's finger um, once people are married. Sometimes a dowry is involved, isn't it, where often the bride's family prove their wealth by giving the dowry to the, to the groom's, sorry, yes, groom's family, I've got it the right way around. Groom's family to the bride's family, sorry. I've never been involved in one, although I should know, shouldn't I, Lena, because I've studied it. So the groom's family to the bride because the bride comes and joins the groom's family. And it's not too different in our society. Uh, if we think about it, what are the biggest celebrations in life? Education, graduation, leaving primary school, maybe secondary school, college, university, photos are taken. Jobs, celebrating jobs, fantastic. Let's worship, let's uh, rejoice, I should say, uh, with those who get new jobs. Financial success, marriage, babies, people having babies. And death is a type of celebration if we have that eternal perspective that life, there's life beyond this world. 
But which of these has the biggest public displays of celebration in money, planning, and, and chat, you know, chat between people? And it's probably marriage. It's probably marriage. And for many, where marriage isn't seen as, a, as vital in a relationship, moving in together is seen as a big thing. Again, it's we're mature enough, we're wise enough, we know each other well enough, and we're moving in together. Now, that isn't quite what the Bible teaches, but it's still celebrated within our Christian culture and within the secular culture outside. I went through uh, a period of life, it doesn't happen so much anymore, but a period of life between 21 and 35-ish, where people frequently said to me, um, particularly uh, some family members, whether I had a boyfriend, whether I was planning to get married, what, what my plans were, and I think they, they sort of didn't want to miss out on any news, to be honest. And I always used to sort of say, oh, I don't know, no, not yet, not yet, I'm hoping, you know, trusting in God, whatever. Um, and those who knew me well also asked me, because they knew that that's what I hoped for. Um, yet others who didn't know me wanted to know because they thought that they might be in for some gossip or something. Um, and we, we look on social media and we see Twitter status or Twitter um, the sort of bio at the top of a Twitter account. And it can tell a lot about someone. And often people write married to or, um, or has a certain job or... Um, lives here or whatever. And Facebook is the same. You can say whether you're married, whether you're divorced, whether you're separated, whatever. Our culture puts it front and centre, our relationship status. The truth is that even though our culture celebrates marriage being a great thing and possibly for some people being the highest achievement, I know that I can say that I am complete without a husband. And if you are unmarried in here, or if you are single, I sort of prefer singleness, uh, the term, rather than being unmarried, because it puts you in your own status. You are complete without a wife. You are complete without a husband. I don't need to be married to know that I'm loved. I don't need to be married to know that I'm accepted or that I'm okay. It doesn't mean that friends shouldn't ask the question. Don't feel bad if you've asked me the question. It's because you love me, whether I'm going to get married or not. But it's a question that is very loaded with possible status conclusions. So I would put a health warning, just be thoughtful when you ask people that question. Marriage is not life's highest calling in God's eyes. You might be challenged by that and think, well, I perhaps need to reconfigure a little bit. You might have a conversation with God about it. Thirdly, singles need married, married people. And married people, marrieds need singles. We need one another. Genesis 2 verse 18 uh, says, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The Genesis narrative follows that Eve is made out of Adam's rib and that she becomes his complementary partner. Not the same but different. And they make a team, a partnership. And so I look on that and I think, oh, okay, where does that leave me? <laughs> where does that leave me? Because I'm not married, so if I'm not married, then where do I fit into this picture? Where's my partnership? Where's my team? What do I do? And what one mustn't do, although I sort of hope that I can do this a bit, is to dismiss verse 18 and just jump over it into the rest of Genesis. But it must be speaking something to me. So what's the plan that God has? What in Corinthians 7 might be something that you're very familiar with. Paul says a lot about what singleness is, what marriage is in the early church. We're talking about about 2,000 years ago. And it's clear that being single or unmarried, being single is a blessing. There have been times, my friends, when I have cried tears of frustration and said to God, being single is not a blessing. Being single is one of the hardest things that I've, I've possibly come across. Um, and I've, I've broken up fights between 16 year olds. And I've, I've been in the Aldi queue for longer than I wanted to be. And it's, but being single, I joke, joke aside, being single is one of the toughest things I think I have 
experienced and tried to work through, but I know that God has been in there with me with it. So if it isn't good for man to be alone, then what about the single person? What does verse 18 have for us there? 1 Corinthians 7 does talk about marriage and singleness, and there's a lot there, and I don't feel I'm qualified to unpack it this morning, particularly in the time I have left. But what I've come to the conclusion is, friendship and companionship can be found with people who are married and those who are single. You can laugh together and be friends with and have a really tight-knit community with those who are married and those who are single. Herein lies the blessing of friendship and companionship. And by companionship, I mean those, the team that you're with on the day, at the time, or that week, or whatever. Not one-to-one -one exclusive companionship as a single person, but the friends that you've been given on your journey as you walk it. And we need companions. We need to be around people that are not just in our own status and not just alike us. I remember being at um, Soul Survival, which is a Christian festival. It no longer exists actually, but way back I went to it a few times when I was a teenager. And I went, with, I went there with um, a friend of mine who was married, recently married to her husband. And um, I sort of made, in the evenings after the main, main meeting, um, I made myself scarce because I sort of thought that she wanted to be with her husband in the cafes or just hanging out and she came to me afterwards and she said where did you go what were you doing um, and I said oh I just thought that you wanted to be with with your husband on your own she said don't be ridiculous we needed you we want to be like hanging out with you and I thought wow friends of mine um, who I'm close to uh, more recently three children and they invite me to stay a lot and I said, this is amazing that you, you open your home to me um, so much. Because I always feel as a bit of an interloper, or I did feel a bit of an interloper, which means someone who doesn't belong there. And they said to me, but you're part of our family. We need you in our family. You make life, family life, fun. You bring a different dynamic to our, our, our home life. I thought, wow. A friend of mine came to me and said, Fee, I need to sit down with you. I need to talk about the loneliness I'm feeling at the moment in my marriage. I need to talk to you and we need to pray together. I feel lonely in my marriage and we need to pray. I said, of course. In those three situations, friends have said I was needed in their lives. I was needed in their lives. And so, those of you who are married, Think about how you can draw single people into that unit. Of course it's exclusive, your marriage is exclusive, but how can you draw single people into that, into that community that you have, that often is quite solid and good and fun? And as single people, how can you make sure that you're making yourself available to being with families, to being with couples, and to being secure in yourself that what you're joining or what you're being part of is really solid and secure. You are valued and you are needed by married people. So finally, coming into land now, we need to exchange lies about marriage for the truth in Christ. The lies about singleness for the truth that Christ gives us. I was in Aldi the other day, so me talking at the front here will always include a story about Aldi, so I'm just going to live with it. Um, and I was wearing dark clothes, I didn't have my trolley with me, I don't know where my trolley was, um, and I was looking at the baked items, and a lady came up to me and said, um, I had my mask on as well, I think it was a dark coloured sort of blue mask, and she said, oh, excuse me, uh, madam, could you show me where the fish, the tinned fish is? And I said, oh, I don't actually work here. And she said, oh, sorry, sorry. And I said, but to be honest, I can tell you exactly where it is because I could go around Aldi with my eyes shut and pick exactly the right items, items off the shelf, um, no problem. So it's over there by uh, the freezer cabinets, just above it, next to the tomato ketchup. 
and off she went, she found her tin fish. The identity that she saw I had was not my co correct identity. I could have pretended that I did work for Audi, and sometimes I'm slightly envious of the job they have, a busy, busy job, but it's systematic, and I quite, all the things I quite like about, about work. Um, and we can, as Christians, take on an identity that doesn't belong to us. We can. We can take it on because the world gives us it. All people speak words into our lives that aren't truth about us. Yet as children of God, and this is for everybody in the room, whatever your marital status is, you have an identity that Christ gives you. Yes, you are a husband. Yes, you are a wife. Yes, you are single. But first of all, you're a child of God. And when we die and when we go to heaven, those of us who trust in Jesus, none of us will be married. And for me, that says quite a lot. It says in the Bible, Jesus said, no one will be married in heaven. For me, that speaks quite a lot about our status or, and our identity needs to first of all be in Christ. Three things that I've believed a lie about singleness are, I am single, this means I'm incomplete. I am incomplete. Secondly, I am single. This means I've been rejected. I'm faulty or I'm not enough. No one's chosen me yet. The third thing, I am single. This means I've been forgotten by God. Those three things, and you may think that's ridiculous. How could Fiona think that? How could? But the things we think in life often don't bear much resemblance to what people think of us today. It's crazy what goes on in our heads. So I'm single, I'm complete, and I'm not fully me. Which part of you is incomplete, I say to myself. If Christ said you are made whole in me, then surely that truth is what I should hang on to, not the fact I'm not yet married. So Christ has made me whole, therefore I am whole. It doesn't matter if I've got a ring on my finger or not. Am I faulty? Am I not enough? Well, for whatever reason, we are single. Christ has made you complete. And you know what? We're all faulty, actually, because we're all sinful. But Christ looks on us, or Father God looks on us as complete, because Christ has made us complete through his death and resurrection. I am enough. You are enough, because Father God says you are. And I'm not going to argue with Father God, because he kind of created the whole universe, and me, and you. And I don't think I've got much... Uh, much chance of winning an argument with Father God. So we are enough. I've been forgotten by God. I don't think God forgets. I don't think God forgets. He may choose to forget our sin and not see our sin, but he doesn't forget us because we are precious and we are made in his image. Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So I don't think he's forgotten us. My current unmarried single status may stay with me for the rest of my life. And you know what? That's okay. I'm saying that in a very secure place this week. Next week it might be quite different. I might be blubbing on the kitchen floor next week. But even if I am, I'm not even joking about that. Even if I am blubbing on the kitchen floor, Christ has made me whole. I am enough because Father God says I'm enough. And Jesus will never leave me or forsake me. Those things we can hold on to, regardless of where we're at. I'm going to pass over to you. it's really important that we should hear you know I mean married people talk about marriage uh, but uh, to have Karen's perspective was just um, so important and valuable. I just want to finish with um, just reminding you what the goal of marriage is uh, the goal of marriage is uh, that we should be conformed to the likeness of his son 
And you know what the goal of singleness is? That we should be conformed to the likeness of his son. So, God will use your singleness to make you more like Jesus. And those of us who are married will know that God uses marriage to make us more like his son. Two simple people living together in close proximity. I mean, you know, you're not spots of each other. Uh, so, um, let's just, uh, I, I just want to encourage you, uh, pray for people who are married, because there is a salt on it. Pray particularly, and I value prayer for myself, um, pray for church leaders, who are in any church leaders you know who are married, because the, the enemy will come after our marriages. Because you, you can destroy a marriage, you can destroy a church. So, um, do pray for us. Um, and uh, take on board the things that uh, Fiona's been sharing. So, you've been sitting for a long time. Let's all stand up. Well done. Children, you've been amazingly good again. Thank you. Bless you. Um, well done, guys. Stretch. Touch your toes. Gosh, some people are touching their toes. Um, so, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much that we are made in your image. Every one of us. And thank you that we've been recreated in Christ. And thank you that your Holy Spirit is in our characters making us more like Jesus. We praise you and thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we thank you. Whether we're single or married, whatever our position, we thank you, Lord, that you love us that we're complete in Jesus. And you are making us more like Jesus. And I just want to release over this church uh, purity, sexual purity, that each person, young and old, that you would keep us and preserve us for those who are married, that you would keep us faithful. For those who are single, that you would keep us uh, just close to you. And that we would, we would become more like Jesus. Give us grace, Lord. I just release contentment over the church. Paul says, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And sometimes when people are married, they can dream about being married to someone else because it's difficult. And single people can dream about uh, some, you know, being married to someone. And give us, in the situation we are now, to be content doesn't mean to say we don't try and change the situation, but our inner peace and contentment. Lord, we pray for that. We pray for that miracle to be done in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Sorry, we've gone slightly into an extra time, but I hope you think it's worth it uh, just, to, just to begin to think through some of these things. Uh, thank you again to Fiona for that magnificent presentation. It's great. Let's just um, bless one another. Different blessing this morning. Now with the peace of God. Now with the peace of God.